hi everyone and thank you for attending my session today. Um, today's presentation, I will share with you preliminary results of a study that was focusing on why wildland firefighters um, are drawn to the progression maps and what are the um, what are the keys that story maps hold and what are they unlocking and why are firefighters visiting these maps over and over and over again. Now from the incident management side of things, accurate wildfire information is critical, not only for the incident management team, but also for the affected community. Um, as we've been seeing more frequently during fire season, we see progression maps becoming more and more popular and getting more notoriety. Progression maps tell the story of the incident. They provide snapshots from a day-to-day -day standpoint, but also those snapshots over time grow and help create the, the narrative of the incident. So for today, I'm gonna to take you on a journey through the progression maps, identify incident maps and, and highlight why they're so important, but really talk about the different applied cartographic methods and um, approaches for the progression map. So a little bit of a, a brief overview of, for today's presentation. Again, I will be introducing incident maps. What are they, how are they, and why are they so important? I will showcase the fire progression map, which is the real star of the show, and then reveal preliminary results. And then the next thing is talking about what's next. What can technology do and add to the growing content of these amazing uh, story uh, progression maps? So it has been a while since I presented at NASIS, and so I just wanted to introduce myself to everyone. Um, so it's been a while, like I said. Um, the background that I have is I'm a, I'm a program coordinator at Johns Hopkins University, and I teach GIS for emergency management. So that's one of the many courses that I teach there. And so I'm really happy to be sharing this project because it's been a passion project that's been on my academic bucket list for quite some time. Um, now, this project topic came to mind when I was out working with wildland firefighters on incidents for the last six years. And during that time, I've had a wonderful opportunity to work alongside the GIS specialists, alongside um, wildland firefighters, and help integrate mobile web GIS um, as it was starting to make its debut on wildfires. So being able to beta test uh, Collector, Esri's Collector, the story maps, and web apps um, were just some of the many different technologies that we were able to apply and integrate on incidents. So let's talk about incident maps. Um, honestly, I would say that it's the ultimate map purpose and audience challenge for any cartographer that's working on an incident as a GIS specialist. Um, each map has its own purpose and its own longevity. So for example, the incident action plan, the IAP map, um, it's created every 12 hours and it only has, you know, 12 hours of longevity and then it's updated. So it's used for sharing information on that given time, uh, allows for the incident um, commander to make decisions and uh, highlight where resources are at. We also have the situational situ situation map. Um, this provides situational awareness about the incident. Um, this one can change over time as uh, containment is, is met with the fire, but it shows um, different types of perimeters of the fire, what fire is being addressed with hand crews, dozer lines, is it contained or is it active? The next two maps that I just highlighted here, these are the briefing maps, um, also known as the BAM, which is a big area map or briefing area map. Um, this particular map, again, is has a longevity of 12 hours, so it's created so, for briefing at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. And keep in mind that all these maps have a certain standardized approach. They have to all go through uh, certain specific incident protocols, and they have to be approved by the situational, um, situational leader before being printed out and distributed for briefing. Um, as a GIS specialist working on um, these particular maps, there was one map that always stood out as being different. And so these different maps required a different focus and different purpose and audience. So for example, the transportation map, the air operations and operations maps shared different information, but it would also was able to um, have a, a longer time or a lifeline, meaning that you would create it perhaps um, once every other day, once a week, depending on how long the incident was. So again, that just really highlights 
You know, every map has its specific purpose. Every map has its specific goal. But the one that I really want to highlight, and actually let's look at the, the maps being used right now for the purpose. So here we see the BAM, right, the big area map. And it literally is six feet by six feet dimension. So imagine creating this map every 12 hours. Notice from a cartographic standpoint, which drive, drove me a little crazy, notice how big the labels are. Notice how big the icons are. Um, you have no control because it's all standardized in, in, in the labels and and um, symbology, but each map has a purpose. And this purpose is to share information, important information to a gathering of people that can be seen um, from at least 40 feet away. So you can get the idea of the purpose of the BAM. I do have to tip my hat off to uh, Dr. Dennis Fitzsimons and Mary Beth Cunha for instilling the map purpose and audience uh, during my undergraduate years at Humboldt State. Um, so definitely uh, it's an important process here. But I do want to introduce the showstopper of incident maps. And this is the fire progression map. This one fire map is different from the rest of the incident maps. The beauty of the information showing temporal and spatial representation that, that unfolds day by day until the final masterpiece is printed and unveiled in its entirety at the end of the incidents is a keepsake for fire personnel. And I have, to get, I have to tell you a little side story here. Um, this was the map that I always volunteered to create just because you had that cartographic license to choose your color ramp, um, choose your background. Are you gonna have blended polygons? Are they gonna be individual polygons? Um, but towards the end of a, a fire incident wrapping up, so it's coming to the end of the fire and resources are becoming demobilized. I always noticed that firefighters would be digging through our recycling pile of, of maps. And they would be pulling out these fire progression maps and they were saving them. And I just thought that was so interesting. And I would, I would ask them, you know, do you guys collect this? Like, what are you guys doing here with these? And they would share that, you know, this is a token of, um, of this incident. I can put my finger on this polygon and say, on this day, my crew was here and that fire grew 5,000 acres. And oftentimes, and I'm gonna just show you an example, they would laminate. This is a fire progression map of the rim fire. You know, they would laminate these maps. Um, sometimes if we were lucky, the GIS specialist would be asked to autograph them, which was kind of great. It made you feel like you're a rock star status on incidents. Um, but I, this always just kind of sat with me as I worked my way through academia and, and always wanted to come back and say, why? What is so unique about the progression map? What is always drawing firefighters back to it? What is so important about the narrative? So like any good narrative, there's a setting, there's a protagonist, antagonist, there's supporting characters, there's problems, conflicts, there's a climax, and then there's resolution, right? At the, oops, sorry, at the end of the narrative. So the work that I did here, this work was inspired by Robert Roth. Um, he published a paper titled Cartographic Design as a Visual Storytelling, Synthesizing and Reviewing of, of Map-Based um, Narratives. And Roth identifies um, the work of a continuity map that makes visual stories more memorable than any kind of map or visualization. And this continuity concept, this, the progression map is the best example of continuity. So because of that, we wanted to, to know more about the magic behind these progression maps and what keeps folks coming back to them. What is so important about the narrative? And what can the community tell us about these maps? Are they using these for tools for training firefighters? Are they using them to reflect upon um, procedures performed on the incident um, or even perhaps lessons learned? Can we learn from these progression maps and help improve um, uh, future incidents? So we went ahead and my students and I, we sent a survey out um, to the wildland fire community um, we posted a survey on a um, public forum called wildfireintel.org, and this was pre-fire season. And we received 210 responses back, which was amazing. Um, so let's go ahead and look and see what those responses look like. So out of those 210 responses, 95% of the folks that responded has, have used progression maps. And so we're looking here, this is one of the statistics, um, and one of the questions here, we asked them to rank the top six progression maps that they revisit time and time again. And so we can see on the y-axis here, these are the number of, of folks that responded. 
And on our X axis here, these are the names of the top six progression maps. Now I ask, you know, what is the correlation here? Because, you know, one would think, well, perhaps it's a fire that's located near a large population. Um, that really wasn't the case in the top six fires that were shared. Some were yes, but others were not. So then we were thinking, well, is it because of, is it acreage? Is there acreage that's tied to why, why progression maps are so popular? And you can see here on the bar charts that, you know, some had large acreages, but some also had small acreages. Well, then you ask the question, is it the duration of time that the fire burned? Well, we can see that one fire, the rim fire near Yosemite was 88 days of, of burning uh, versus the Bulls fire, which was five days. So really it wasn't a duration of time. So what is the, the factor that's drawing folks to at least these top six progression maps? And so the conclusion, and, I, and I'm, I'm asking this to the audience, but what, what my students and I were coming to is that each one of these fires had a significant lesson learned. It was perhaps the, the fire grew to 10,000 acres. There were 18,000 structures that were damaged. There were um, fatalities. And what can we learn from those fatalities? The fires, you know, the start of the fires were all across the board from electrical to natural to arson. Um, and so there really wasn't any type of fluidity or consistency with the, with the cause of the fire. But the lessons learned was the big take home message. Really what was happening on individual points and what can be taken away from these progression maps. And I'm always interested you know, for interpretation. So feel free to reach out to me if anyone has any additional ideas for the continuity standpoint. But really the, the progression map is offering the lessons learned. The lessons learned where folks can come back, they can relive that incident, they can, they can pinpoint the, the exact time and location where the winds picked up, where they were um, up against the old redwood growth of trees and protecting them with the Yosemite fire. Um, and so let's go ahead now and look at the personalities, the individual personalities of these progression maps. So in this survey, we asked the firefighters to share with us um, how do they use the progression maps? So these are looking at, this is looking at the top four progression maps that were highlighted in the survey. So one of the responses were progression maps are good. It's a good learning tool. It's a good learning tool when you're showing up on incident and you need to be briefed very fast on exactly, you know, where the fire is at, how is it moving from the day-to-day -day basis and how is it grow, grown? So it's a good tool to brief um, folks. Another um, survey response was that they're a great visual. Um, and they show the impact that the fire has, especially um, the speed in which the fire can grow and how the terrain and wind can influence the direction. Um, and also, I love that they mentioned that there's other data that you can incorporate here that can illustrate um, how it impacts the fire. And so as you're looking at these progression maps, I hope you're seeing the different cartographic signatures that um, the GIS specialists are adding to these fire progression maps, because there really isn't uh, a right way or a wrong way. There are definitely some standards of you know, things you might want to consider, but we do see that the, all of these maps look very different in their own persona. Um, the second part of the survey, we asked, you know, what do you think of the future progression maps? What does it look like? And so we can look at progression maps from this season. Look a little different. They look a little different from colors um, you know, from year to year. We're seeing much more brighter colors. Um, we're looking at the Dixie fire, the Caldor fire, the lava fire. And so in the response of, you know, what can, what does the future look like? Um, one of the survey respondents said, um, you know, progression maps, I like where they blend the colors. Um, and it also helps us see where there's, you know, big jumps within the data too. Um, and so that's some interesting input. Another contribution on feedback um, provided that they think that the future of progression maps are story maps and that story maps allow for activity to be added to the narrative, to the story as each day unfolds. And we can see that progression happening. And honestly, that was such a beautiful response because uh, it feeds right into this next second half of the presentation looking at the technology. So I wanted to highlight a progression map, the first progression map um, that was created in the digital, digital platform that was in 2013. And this progression map, um, the story map was created, um, I was a part of the 
team at the disaster response program with Esri, and as an outside contractor, we were able to apply uh, these polygons and use a beta product called Story Maps. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this guy here, and let's look at this. this is the first time again that um, the Esri Story Maps were used to convey the story of an incident. So. You know, it's a, it's a definitely a different look and feel than the static progression maps that are created on incident. But I'm just going to go ahead and jump um, to the rim fire. So again, this was near Yosemite. This was a, a large fire. Um, each one of those polygons um, has available pop-up information that can provide additional information about the incident. We're also able to integrate um, wildfire potential. So looking at where is there potential for the wildfire to grow, um, where is there potential for the wildfire to be suppressed and, and slow down? Um, but more so, you know, in adding richness to the narrative, we can add historical fire perimeters that really provides more to the story about why the fire is behaving the way that it is. Has it burnt here in the past? Has it never burnt it here in the past? And all of this just adds to the richness of the, the story of the progression map. So, with that said, let's just jump back over here. Oops. I bring up my window again. Let's jump back in here. So the thing is, is with this, with this research and this passion project of mine, it's, it's not going to end. The next step is, you know, where do we go from here? This is just the tip of the iceberg um, in using progression maps to expand the narrative while enhancing the story of the incident. There's so much more to investigate such as creating sub-daily fire perimeters and integrating more so satellite imagery um, from the background of meteorology, real-time um, winds, and looking at changes in the atmosphere from humidity and how that intensifies the fire. And so, and also how do you get the most value of this, you know, pre-existing product, but as you enhance it with technology. And so the next couple of presentations from here on out will be focused on the technology aspect. With that said, there's uh, quite a few people I have to thank. I have to thank the 210 firefighters that responded to my survey pre-fire season. Um, I want to say special thanks to those firefighters that are out there um, working very hard still today as we are wrapping up fire season. Um, but I want to uh, highlight this photo. And this is a photo that one of my former students sent to me from the Cedar Creek fire of this year. And you're looking at a tent, and this is the GIS tent on a fire incident. And I have to give special thanks. There's so much um, respect to the GIS specialists that are working on fires that are creating amazing maps under short time periods that are working under so many different unique situations. And it's not an ideal environment to be creating maps in. So again, thank you for attending my session and I look forward to your questions and um, have a great day.